it's March. The daffodils are out and the birds are singing, the buds are on the trees, so much is happening. I'm starting the video inside today. I uh, thought it'd make a change for me not to have my hat on and my big coat, although out and about I have been taking those off lately because there is definitely a change in the barometer and the temperature. Things are a little bit milder. Um, so let's see what's happening. So March is our third month of the year, although back in the olden days it was actually the first month of the year and it was named after Martius, the Roman god of war, where the planet Mars is also named after. But he wasn't just the Roman god of war, he was also the Roman god of farming. And traditionally, although things have changed a bit lately, traditionally March would be the month where all the farming starts up again and the soldiers, after the long winter break, even they like to have a rest over the winter, would start exercising and getting fit and healthy, ready for soldier type activities and war, I guess. Um, so the old Saxon name for March was Lentenmonath, or Lenten, Lentmonath, Lentmonath. And that is where our term Lent comes from that we use today for this period up until Easter. Well, we've already had the full moon this month, but the full moon in March is called the plough moon. And that's because of the farming that's traditionally starting up again. And the farmers out preparing the fields, ready to put their seeds in. The birthstone of the month is aquamarine and the star signs are Pisces. And my little fish has had her birthday and Aries, which leads into April. The flower of March, you've probably guessed it, is the daffodil. And the daffodil has a few colloquial names. One is the daffodown dilly, which I just love the sound of. And also the Easter lily or the Lent lily. Um, the Latin name for the daffodil is the Narcissus. And the daffodil was named after the mythological character Narcissus, who was a very vain man, um, a hunter perhaps, who was out one day and saw his reflection in a lake and sat kneeling beside it and um, well I always was told as a child that he fell in and drowned but apparently he just wasted away so the reason is because the daffodil has its drooping head that uh, it sort of resembles him staring at his reflection um, and because of that daffodils were actually associated with death for a long time and were pr uh, planted on top of graves um, and, it, and it was thought that you should never bring daffodils in the house and one of the main reasons was most people had their own poultry back then and it was bad luck for the poultry they would not lay very well for the year or the brood that they would have wouldn't hatch so um, you shouldn't take your daffodils inside if you have chickens and ducks and such like. There's nothing more lovely than finding a few daffodils when the rest of the earth is still quite bare, especially when you find a host of daffodils, a group of them all together. And that term was made famous by Wordsworth in his very famous poem about daffodils. From when he came across um, a huge host of daffodils up at Allswater in the Lake District as he was walking along with his sister Dorothy. It inspired him to make the poem and my granny used to recite this poem um, among many others, some that weren't allowed to be said in front of young ears. Uh, but she taught my older sister the daffodils poem and um, it really is lovely. I don't know it so I'm just going to read you the first verse. So it goes like this. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So he was uh, quite a nature lover Wordsworth and he also liked the other little flower that's out at this time that I put on my last video, the humble little golden celandine, which is very attractive but not good to eat. And uh, he wrote this about the celandine. There is a flower that shall be mine, tis the little celandine. So that's Wordsworth, that's daffodils. Uh, one thing about your daffs, it is tempting to deadhead them, um, but really, if you want them to be really bright and healthy the following year, you should let them 
die down till the leaves are yellow before you touch them and remove them. One thing's for sure, when you do see those daffodils, spring's definitely here. And March is the start of the calendar month of spring, um, the calendar season of spring, sorry, and the meteorological start of spring. So some say March uh, the 1st is the start of spring, St. David's Day. Um, others will say, no, not until the equinox on the 21st. And the equinox is that uh, point in time, the midpoint between the winter solstice and the summer solstice. And on the equinox, the amount of night time and daytime is exactly the same and that's because the sun is right over the equator at that point. The weather in March is still pretty unpredictable and Charles Dickens talked about it being um, summer in the light and winter in the shade and he's very true. March seems to be a bridge that joins together winter and summer. There's some old colloquial sayings about the weather in March and that is uh, it comes in like a lion and then will go out like a lamb. So the wet and windiness that we get in March, which March is renowned for, the windy windiness, um, will eventually die down and lead to a softer start to April. If, however, it starts the other way around and March comes in like a lamb, usually it will go out like a lion. This year I think it did come in like a lion so hopefully we're in for some good weather as the month progresses. I'm going to read you a list of things that happen in March. So we've got St David's Day uh, and if you can see a little head here popping around, my beautiful little Evangeline has just crawled onto my knee. Um, <laughs> so you might see some little ears. Um, so March the 1st is St David's Day and that's traditional with daffodils and leeks and apparently whoever finds the first daffodil will be rewarded with gold and not silver. There's a tail here. Uh, <laughs> on the 10th, there's the uh, Hindu festival of Hol Holi. I'm not sure if I've said that right, but that is where everybody goes out and celebrates and throws paint and chalk paints at each other. Um, and that is a celebration of good triumphing over evil and the arrival of spring. Um, and then the Jewish festival of Purim, where there is a big feast and everybody gives gifts and it's a time of thankfulness arrives. And here on the 17th, it's St. Patrick's Day, which is a massive celebration, particularly in Ireland and some of the major cities in the UK. Uh, so then we get the meteorological start of spring around about the 20th, 21st, and that leads to the cats playing with a balloon. I'm sorry if that pops. Um, that leads to a stara, which is the old original festival that Easter was born out of. Don't forget Mother's Day. Mother's Day is on the 22nd. And that, I never knew this, always falls on the fourth Sunday of Lent. Uh, and apparently it was originally a Christian festival where people would um, travel to go back home to their mother church from wherever they had gone in the country. They migrated back for a day and I guess spent the day with their family that day. Um, and then on the 25th this year, um, and I think every year actually, is the Annunciation. And that is when the angel Gabriel came down to Mary and told her she was going to have a baby. Uh, and I talked a little bit about that last week with the Archangel plant and that that traditionally flowers around that time. Hence its name. And if you can't remember, the Archangel is the dead nettle, the little nettle that's not actually a nettle, it's part of the mint family, with the little white leaves that my um, petals that my little girl likes to suck the pollen out of. So in the olden days, they used to divide the calendar up into quarters and they would um, arrange the finances and the leases of the land all to do with these quarters. Um, and so Ladies' Day was actually the mark of the first quarter. The next one would be the summer solstice and then Michaelmas Day and then Christmas. So things like new um, leases and new contracts would be drawn up 
on and around the Annunciation, around uh, Ladies' Day. And to, to even to this day in the UK, our tax year starts on the 1st of April and that is um, heralds back to the Ladies' Day and all those contracts and financial arrangements being wrapped up and set for the following year. So that's a little introduction to March and its history. I'm going to move to the outside now and show you what's out to forage and about nature and the birds and the flowers. Um, I'm going to be going to different sites. So I'll do the, the rest of the video over a few different shoots. So I might have different coats on. So uh, for those who are observant amongst you, that's why I might be dressed differently as the video progresses. So let's see what we can find. I'm just crouching down by my pond in the garden. The other night when I was locking the chickens up, it sounded like the motorbikes were all revving up their engines in the garden, like a brr, brr, brr. And I said to Bella, we're gonna have some frog spawn in a few days. And sure enough, it's March the 12th today and it's here. Let me show you. So here's the first batch. We normally get quite a bit more than this. Look at that, like a load of little eyeballs peeping up at me. And whilst I've been sat here, I have seen a frog darting about, but he knows I'm here, so he's dived underneath, or she has, keeping probably a very watchful eye on all these eggs. So um, over the next few days, there'll be a lot more frog spawn. Look at all these, um, these are yellow irises that come up every year but they're beginning to take over a little bit. It needs a good old weeding out does this pond. I'm pretty sure there's a natural spring under this particular part of the garden. I know the hill has over 300 in but um, yeah this is a natural pond that is always here. Just goes up and down with the water table and there are this year's tadpoles waiting to happen. So we'll keep a close eye on those over the next few weeks. Try and keep the heron away. I've just pulled my car over at the side of this road. There's the most beautiful amount of blackthorn here. Let me show it you. But before I do, uh, blackthorn is what um, the slows grow on and the wood is often made into walking sticks. But years ago, if you had a walking stick made of blackthorn, people thought you were a witch and they were actually really scared of um, people pointing these blackthorn walking sticks at pregnant ladies. So um, yeah, quite a superstitious tree, the blackthorn. So this one's by a really busy road. So when it does produce slows, I wouldn't pick it from here. Never get them from beside a busy road. The beautiful trees are busy absorbing whatever they can, pollutants. And so you wouldn't want to eat the fruits from this. But blackthorn is always the first blossom that you will see. So look out for it because this is where your slows will grow in the autumn. I'm just down by Papawit Pumping Station. That's the big tower over there. It's a beautiful old building over there if you ever get a chance to visit. But on the opposite side of the road there's these lovely little lakes. It's a really nice short and flat walk around them. I've come down here because I wanted to get some uh, see what was happening around this area and I know that it's full of gorse so there's some there look in the distance I wanted to try and get some pictures of gorse and since I've been here I can't believe it just down here in this little patch down there I've actually seen two fledgling robins it's pretty early but they were definitely there fluttering about with the uh, parent feeding them um, so let's take a look there's a little in the tree over there there is a thrush singing away if you listen and the bird song is just incredible this morning so let's take a look I'm standing here right by this gorse with the sun in my eyes and the, su the sun's shining away on it and the smell coming off it is just beautiful it smells like coconut um, 
doesn't taste like coconut though. <laughs> I can remember as kids my mum taking a handful because it smelt so coconutty and, and that is something she really likes. Um, and <laughs> was spitting it all out in disgust because it tasted nothing like it. However, it's not too bad the taste of the gorse and you can actually eat it. Um, so you want one that's open. You kind of get an initial flavour of coconut and then it kind of goes a bit grass-like. But in the olden days, people used to colour their hard-boiled eggs at Easter time yellow with these. Um, and you can do all sorts with the gorse flowers. You can make honey, honey, um, gorse honey, and you can use them on your cakes to make your cakes look pretty. They're very edible and they're in abundance. So there's enough for you and the bees. So they're on the, a very spiky plant. So do be careful when you're picking them and it takes quite a while to get them. But um, you can actually make, um, gorse wine and put these on salads and also some people put them on ice creams but I think the most common thing to do with them is add them to honey. Other things that we could be looking at for in March foraging, Stellaria media, the little uh, chickweed that we talked about in a different video and uh, Jack by the Hedge which is the, um, the the garlic mustard leaves that I was munching on last month, um, the violets and um, what else is it? Oh the hawthorn, the hawthorn buds, the little tiny buds of the leaves of hawthorn used to be known as bread and cheese and if you get them when they're young enough and you munch on them they taste quite nutty um, and hawthorn is really good as a heart tonic so anything to do with the hawthorn is really good at balancing your circulation and your blood pressure and it works for both people with um, low blood pressure and high blood pressure it's it's like a, an adaptogen for your circulatory system um, but if you're on warfarin or blood thinners or anything like that you should check check out taking it first with your gp but um uh, yeah, so hawthorn, what else? I've made a list. Early dandelions. Yes, the dandelions are beginning to pop out. Leave the flowers because it's still quite early in the season for um, the bees. There's so much silver birch here and I actually bought um, a tapping kit this year because silver birch is a really great tree to tap in March to get uh, some of the sap out. And you have to be careful how you do it and be really responsible. But um, basically I missed my opportunity because you have to do it within the first two weeks of March and, and I'm just past that now doing this. Um, but next year I'll have a go at tapping some silver birch. But if you are thinking about doing that, you do have to be really responsible and make sure you plug up the hole afterwards and go back the following day and check, check it's plugged up. Otherwise the tree can literally bleed to death. That's something to do next year maybe. There is so much gorse around this walk. It's really lovely. It's not all out yet. It's going to be a real picture in a few weeks time when it's all out. Um, and me and little one will come down and pick a few to take home and make things with. Apart from gorse and the dandelions and violets, um, blackthorn uh, and the daffodils, there's not that much flowering at the minute that's um, out and about in the wild you've got all like your pretty garden things that are beginning to pop up but um, native species it's still quite bare out there I have been told by a reliable source that somewhere along this walk is some pussy willow and that is what I am desperate to find this morning oh I've just seen a jay I'll see if I can get hold of it as I walk by it's disappeared into the uh, into the tangle of all this silver birch and jays are very secretive you always see sort of just see the back end of them fl flitting away and they're remarkable birds they they squirrel away hundreds and hundreds of um acorns and uh, cash them it's called caching when the carrions the carrion family are the crows and the magpies and the jays um they cache their findings their acorns all over the place and sometimes often forget where they are and hence new oak trees will pop up 
it's a glorious month March by the end of the month we'll have that extra hour of daylight uh, there'll be baby lambs bouncing about everywhere and the birds will be singing like crazy because April time brings the loudest and most joyful dawn and evening chorus just gonna head through the brush here down this little path and show you the lakes Here we are. We've got some visiting geese over there. They're not normally down here. I saw these all over a field the other day. There were hundreds of them I'm trying to zoom. There we are. My fingers are a bit cold this morning, aren't working too well. These migrating geese <clears throat> have just reminded me about all the other birds that are set to arrive. And actually the ospreys that are um, having, there's a program in England to really up the population of ospreys. And they'll be heading back about now from Africa to um, raise their young over here. Ospreys have this amazing way of dealing with the water when they're catching their fish. As they dive down, their nostrils actually shut and close to help them um, avoid that water intake up the nostril. So other birds that are migrating um, are, particularly in the south of England, they'll start to arrive uh, and then up the rest of England and the UK a little after. Uh, chiff chaffs, black caps, although the black caps have been found to be preferring to stay in England for a large amount of the year now. Um, and different types of warblers, the sand martins and house martins will be on their way and the swallows a little later. Uh, in some southern parts they can be found swallows and um, house martins and sand martins around the end of this month. It makes you wonder why on earth they would come to England. Well, the answer is the insects. So because we have this lovely mixture of um, cold and damp and sometimes warm weather, <laughs> You know, be noisy. Um, the insects thrive in England and there's more of an abundance of food for the migrating birds to feed their young. <laughs> there won't be any kingfishers here, but if you live by a river, the kingfishers are very busy at the minute. The male's busy looking for the fish and for a female to build his nest with. And I can't hear any skylarks here but uh, the skylarks will be up first before any of the other birds at the minute to make sure that their song is heard loud and clear. And sadly, the skylarks are in decline because of modern farming methods or the way that the agriculture has changed. Um, so that's something that's really sad because they sound so beautiful. It is nest building season. So try to avoid trimming your hedges now because you might just disturb a, a nest and um, that would be really sad. But I just wanted to talk about some of the different ways that birds' nests are built and one in particular, the chaffinch. We all know the chaffinch, but did you know this clever little, clever little bird goes out and captures as many spider's webs as it can and uses them as a mortar to stick around the um, nest to hold everything together. I think that's really clever. Some goldfinches have just caught my eye. So the wren, tiny little bird, the male wren will um, make several nests and then take his lovely lady friend to view them all and then she will pick the one that she likes. <laughs> A bit like us when we're choosing our houses. Um, I know I was the one that was always more fussy than my half, other half. This reed grass is so tall, it just goes up and up and up and up and up. So murmurations of starlings are still happening for a little while yet. I keep seeing birds darting into all this uh, long grass behind me. If I point it that way, I might catch them. I think there's some kind of buntings, but um, it was that area there. So um, murmurations are still happening and basically it's safety in numbers with the murmurations and they'll swarm together um, just you know to protect themselves um, but very often when you see the big swirling patterns in them um, you might see a darker shaped bigger bird on the outskirts. It's often a peregrine falcon or a, um, a kestrel 
out hunting, out hawking for its prey. And so um, that's when they make these massive swathing movements in the sky and these aerial somersaults, like, like the big swarms of fish you see do it as well when the sharks are after them. And it's to confuse the, um, the hawk that's after them. It's a lovely crow up there taking some, some material up for his nest or her nest. Yeah, got a pair of buzzards. There's one. Another one's just disappeared from the shot. They'll be after their breakfast. And there's more breakfast to choose from as the animals have started to come out of hibernation. So the dormouse is out, the hedgehog is out, the bats are out, um, and the, what's happening is more baby animals are being born so the fox cubs have just been born and the vixen will have between five and I think the record number was 13 cubs and the little cubs are born blind and deaf and totally rely on their mother for warmth so the dog fox is very busy at the minute because she, the mother can't leave them and uh, the dog fox is out trying to find all the food so the dog fox is out having to find all the food for the vixen to feed her and the cubs. And this is where the young juvenile females from last year get involved because they have to help. So it's most likely this month of the year when the dog fox is working hard and getting quite tired of doing so um, that you have to watch your poultry if you keep chickens or um, geese or ducks. It could be usually this month where um, they get overrun with having to keep up with the demands of feeding everybody that they would resort to straying into people's gardens and killing their chickens. And the vixen, if she thinks the dog fox is messing around and taking too long, um, rightly so, if she's got to keep her babies fed she will stray to the end of the uh, the opening of her nest and start barking saying hurry up get your bum back home and feed us all when we were talking about sap earlier this tree has recently been cut watch in the middle look you see it literally dripping it out maybe i haven't missed it after all the sap i'm gonna taste this which tastes just like water. Sorry, went off shot then. It's just pouring out of this. It's incredible. You can see the branch is wet from here to here. Well, we've had no rain. This is very definitely sap just pouring out of this silver birch tree. Gosh, it's the same all along here. Someone's gone along and and trimmed these overhanging branches and they're all just pouring sap out of them. Gosh, this is literally like someone's left the tap on. Tastes of um, just water really but a very very pure water with a tiny hint of sweetness. Back in the autumn I was putting our chickens to bed one night and I thought I saw a snake and after a little bit of research it actually turns out it was a slow worm and it was um, trying to probably hibernate. Well they'll be coming out right now so I'm going to be watching with interest in my garden keeping a close eye on my cat as well because I imagine uh, she's not very good at catching things but I think one of those she could probably manage um, and along with those uh, my pond is now absolutely full of frog spawn and the way you tell whether you've got a frog or a toad that's laid it is um, frogs will lay their spawn in great big clumps which mine is and toads are more string like look at all this glorious lichen on this tree it's a buddleia that's got really tall this will be full of butterflies in not too many weeks away going back to frogs there's lots of 
wonderful people all over the country who are on frog watch on roads at the minute where frogs are crossing to get to uh, where they're, they spawned because they do return every year to the same spawning point and uh, we've got one near us on Beanford Lane in Calverton the lovely people go out and guard all the hundreds of frogs that are crossing and the road is closed and I just think that is just humanity uh, in you know showing its best side looking after the tiny vulnerable creatures and in March it's actually National Frog Day so if you know of a particular road near you where frogs are getting squashed you can get in touch with the Frog Society and tell them and they'll organise with some lo lovely volunteers to go out and supervise that area. I don't know if you can see my necklace very well but what I've got here are two two boxing hairs and it's the time of the, the time of the year when the hairs do go a bit crazy they're usually solitary animals but you see them mixing together at this time of year and you'll see them boxing each other in the fields and it's a common misconception that it's the two males boxing to fight over a woman but uh, actually it's the female hare fighting off unwanted attraction from um, pesky pesky male hairs that won't leave her alone so she gives him a bop on the nose a little early bumblebee here he doesn't want his video or his pictures being taken he's so fast this um scots pine is brimming with early cones it looks gorgeous it looks really healthy lovely shimmery green don't forget you can make a really nice tea with pine needles and they're actually full of vitamin C great time of year to have them especially at the moment this this current uh, situation we have going back to hares they can actually run at up to 35 miles an hour which is just incredible and even though they have that ability they have this really silly reflex when they're in danger if a combine harvester is coming towards them in the field or what have you instead of running off they just freeze and stand still even though they are capable of outrunning basically everything so um, when a female has her baby hair which is called a leveret they lay them not in burrows but just in a flattened piece of grass um, and she'll pluck some of her belly hair out to line the um, the little hole that she'll lay it in and the leveret is born um, eyes open ready to go really um, it relies on its mother for food for a little while and and she'll leave it all day long in this little hole in the grass and it has the ability of remaining really still like a statue some starlings just flew over in a bunch um, and then return in the evening time to feed it this beautiful alder tree is showing all its fruit from last year and its catkins from last year on its skeletal frame as it hasn't got any leaves out at all yet. I can see some some buds here. Hang on, let me put my hand behind that. And see these little pink things? They are the pollinated um, early blossom here. The that require the pollination sorry to grow the fruits for next year but you would hardly notice these unless you crept up to this tree and had a good look at it but there you are alder flowers not elder flowers that's different this is alder a l d e r just going back to birds uh, one thing I did want to mention was if you look, live where you're lucky enough to ever see golden eagles, which is on my bucket list to do before I die, go and see some golden eagles in their natural environment, then apparently, and this just sounds amazing, they do this marvellous display this kind of time of year where they pair up with their long-term partners again and ready for the breeding season and do this um, amazing display of aerial um, acrobatics that's called sky dancing and um, they will do huge swoops with each other and the male will take up to great heights 
pieces of mud or little pebbles and he'll drop them and then race down and plummet down and catch them before they hit the floor. Um, some say it's all about the mating kind of rituals and dances and some people more recently say it's to do with marking their territory, keeping other rival males away but oh my goodness I would just love to see that done. So over winter many female worker bees have died so the queen bee in the hive will be busy laying her eggs to replace all those hard-working females <laughs> um, and what she'll do she'll put this like waxy yellow substance over the larva to protect them she'll be sending off her remaining staff out to bring early pollen back so all the um, forsythia and the red currant and the blackthorn and pussy willow all really important at this time of year for keeping the hives going that's why i wouldn't really recommend or ever make myself the syrups with the early flowering um, bushes that the bees need so much and although i haven't really seen any yet other than a butterfly that got a bit confused and um, came out of hibernation it must have come in on a log by our log burner um, last month um, in which case if that happens to you you just need to put them in a little box that's got um, so that they've got air holes in the box or or leave a flap open and put them in a shed or a garage or something and then check on them again in March but other than that butterfly I've not really seen any out in the wild yet although it, it, it does say that this month is the month where the tortoise shells peacocks it was a peacock one that I saw um, that came out a little early uh, painted ladies brimstone butterflies all these will be uh, needing all these early blooms to um, fatten themselves up and keep them going and give them some energy after hibernation I'm ready for going off and destroying all the <laughs> all the nasturtiums in my garden and laying their eggs and the early moths They'll be whizzing around in the night time and the hungry bats that have been hibernating and just emerged from their hiberniculums will be feasting on those. I think this is the one that my mother told me about. And these look gorgeous in a vase, you know, they really do. Just take a, a sprig and, and put it in a vase on your table. I haven't got my secateurs with me and I don't want to go snapping bits off but uh, oh they feel so silky they're so so um inviting to touch beautiful look like little jewels decorating the branches don't they so this one is more cone shaped and has these beautiful this one's just about lost all its pollen that one beautiful big floral displays here's one that's still pollen encrusted and these are the grey willow I only know that because I've got an app on my phone it's really good called leaf snap where you point it at the, uh, the plant that you're trying to look at there's loads of different types of willow but basically when you see these gorgeous little furry bunny tails that make the pussy willow catkins pussy willow kind of covers it all oh, the sun's come out again thank goodness my fingers are absolutely frozen i can't work the button on the camera very well uh things to do then in march so now's the time to put bird boxes up if you haven't already done so although you may be a little late especially as um, blue tits and great tits the ones that commonly use the boxes do like to check them out from around the autumn time so don't be offended or disheartened if they don't use your box this year if you're just putting one up they might just suss it out for next year um other things to do oh gosh loads of starlings again how can you catch them behind me no, missed it, sorry. Um, other things that you can do is make sure you're still feeding the birds, um, especially at this time of year, the fat balls are, are the best if they're having young babies, that, that's more uh, safe for them to take back to their young. Um, what else have I put down? Plant some seeds if you haven't done already. Look at those big 
big white clouds against that blue sky behind me it looks lovely um, plant some seeds so I've got sweet peas that I'm putting in pots at the minute and some lupin seeds um, and watch them grow watch them grow it and then transplant them out gradually as they get stronger and a little bigger um, if you've got children they might enjoy making a hedgehog feeding area uh, hedgehogs are in decline their numbers are really low you don't see them very often anymore uh, they were saying that in the next 10 years they could even become extinct which is just criminal so if you make a little area and put some cat food in it the meaty type uh, not the fish varieties then um, there's instructions on the internet how to make a little hedgehog feeding station you could look at that with your kids uh, what else have I written down? Pick some daffodils and put them in vases. Brighten your house up with those gorgeous blooms of daffodils that Wordsworth loved so much. But if you're superstitious and you have poultry, maybe you might want to avoid that one. It's a good time to go stargazing. February and March, the skies are lovely and clear and bright and you can still see Orion high up in the sky watching over everybody. Uh, and great for looking out for shooting stars at this time of year when this, the, the sky just looks crisp and, and bright. Other things you can do, go out foraging. There's a lot of really young shoots popping up at the minute which are the best sort to have. Um, you can make yourself some cleavers tea that will give you a good clear out um, lymphatically. Uh, you could make some tincture with your cleavers. You could make some lovely oil with the chickweed in case you get any flare-ups with your skin. Um, and there's lots of edible things out there as well. So the, the wild garlic mustard, that's really nice on salads. Oh, the wind's, wind's getting up. Um, and gar uh, the wild garlic, now's the time to be looking for the wild garlic in the wooded areas. Uh, that is so tasty um, and three-cornered leek that's kind of similar to the wild garlic so get outside and get foraging maybe you could make yourself some nice pine needle tea I just love how daffodils just pop up amongst all the wayside randomly I mean they're nice in your garden when you plant them where you want them but I just love to see them popping up in their natural habitat so just standing under this lovely Scots pine I've got a bit of a thing for them really I wanted to show you that this has little flowers on it too let's have a look turn you around here we are look right there if you look close enough you'll notice things you've never seen before that is what keeps these trees growing that is the little flower that gets pollinated amazing Gosh, it's lovely in this sunny spot now. Um, and I'm going to stand next to this gorgeous Scots pine while I talk about our message for the month. So, who were we being last month? What month was it? February. Uh, oh, we were being crows, weren't we? And clearing out our nests and getting rid of anything that was unwanted in our lives and clearing out our bodies as well. Well, this month, I think we should all take a lesson of the female hair and just stand up for yourself. Stand up for yourself, even in the face of somebody that you think might be stronger or more vocal than you or more powerful than you. If you think you are um, being treated unfairly, then stand up for yourself. Don't take it lying down. Box them on the nose, not literally. <laughs> but be a female hair. Um, you know, there's certain emotions that Dr. Mario Martinez has talked about in many of his books that are actually damaging to your immune system and damaging to your cells. And one of them is um, when you're treated unfairly and you've not done anything about it. And he recommends something called righteous anger. Righteous anger, if you've been treated unfairly or badly, then say something, speak up for yourself and don't take things lying down. You know, you're only on this earth in this life for a short period of time. So don't be a doormat, be a female hair and uh, get boxing. You know what I mean, not literally, but 
be a female hare. Anyway, that's it for March. Hopefully in April, the weather will be lovely, a lot warmer, and there'll be a lot more to look at. Take care, look after yourselves, look after your loved ones. Bye.